It is a distinct pleasure for me right now to introduce our next speaker. He and I go back to 1976 when another student manager brought him into an informational session that was being run by a senior at Harvard named Dan Moore. So I'm wearing my Harvard tie in honor of this. We go back a very, very long way. I'm going to fast forward. Today he is a professor of medicine and also chairman of the Health Services Policy and Practice Division at Brown University, an Ivy League school and one of the top universities in America. He has been a professor of medicine, he has been an MD, he has been a practitioner ever since he got through medical school. His focuses are primarily on helping understand not how to necessarily treat symptoms, but what is the improvement in quality of life as a result of health care. His research has focused for many, many years on people with HIV AIDS, the, the least served, the most disadvantaged populations in our country to figure out how to deal with the real crises that occur. It tells you something about his heart. One of the exciting things that he takes pride in is that he's personally mentored more than 100 individuals in an intensive way who are now in positions of leadership in healthcare, making a difference across the country. In Rhode Island, where he lives, the governor asked him to be involved in co-chairing a process to reinvent Medicaid. And I think all of you understand the grave difficulties with that. Medicaid in Rhode Island is one-third of the entire state's budget, and they've been able to work on some phenomenal programs to make such a difference in what happens. So his focus is on things that make a difference in people's lives. But what he loves is teaching. He started a course at Brown University called Healthcare in America. Now, wouldn't it be amazing to understand healthcare in America? From a brand new course eight years ago, it is today the most popular course at Brown. In fact, one out of four Brown undergraduates takes that course at some time during their time. Imagine a classroom of 450 people when there's only about 5,000 undergraduates at any given time. It's exciting because his heart has always been about giving. I'm going to share with you a little bit about his background, though. Jeff, if we can take a look. This is the Superstar book from 1976. If you think you have a cool Superstar book, you have nothing done this one. Ira and I sold books in Arizona. We feel not sorry for you one bit about your turf. <laughs> Ira that summer successfully had more than 20 zero days. He would sell several people and then nobody. He set a record for inconsistency on the book field. And when the summer was over, it was distinctly, definitely below average as a producer. But Ira also understood there was a lot to be gained from this and a lot to share with people. And the next year, he brought seven hometown friends who were all going to different universities to come out with him. If we can show the Superstar book from 1977, look at that. That is the year episode four hit the screens. And Ira not only won Explosion Award with double growth, but that seven-person team was definitely a top team in the company. The next year, 1978, representing the Olympiad, Ira took a step back in the numbers of people on his personal team, but many of his organization had come back, and by this time he had more than 20 people in his organization while he was a junior at Harvard. He again won Double Growth Award that particular year. Who's from Louisiana here? Wyatt and a few of you. He met a cow in Louisiana. I'm not going to tell you how but it was a frightening experience when your car headlights meet the cow. He is tough as nails and came back the next year, 1979. He's going to tell you a few of the details of what happened, but I can share with you that he went into spring break that year with nine people on his team. I talked to him the day after spring break, and he said, we've had a change of circumstance. There are now two people on the team. You see, one of those people on the team took it on himself to call the others over spring break and tell them this was a really bad idea. So imagine being after spring break with two people on your team. Ira came to sales school with 15 people on his team. Despite completing his major honors theses in one of the most difficult courses that there was at Harvard, and that team sold 30,000 units as the number one team that anyone had brought as an in-school student. That superstar book looks a little, well, first of all, flip one more. There is Ira. And when you see him come up, kind of remember that image, because most of us get older, Ira has not. But in 1979, when he achieved that great distinction in the superstars book, 
as the number one team, again double growth. So he had increased from 1,000 units his first summer to approximately 9,000 units that last summer. He set a paradigmatic example for people that are in school and made a huge difference. DSLs will tell you they learn more from their people than the people learn from them. And I can honestly say that is true with Ira. One of the great things about Ira is his wife, Lynn. They've been married some 35 years. His children, Bennett and Tyler, daughter-in-law, Kit. I'm just delighted he's here. One of my dearest friends in the world. Let's welcome Dr. Ira Wilson. So this is kind of nice that you uh, give me a little uh, appreciation beforehand, but um, I, you don't know what you're getting into yet. <laughs> so look at this. It's 20 past 8. Are you guys awake? Yeah. yeah. OK. So usually when I teach in a big group, I have some way of uh, kind of interacting with the audience. I don't know you guys, so I won't try to do much interaction. But, but let me see if we could do one thing. So, I'm going to ask a couple questions now and again. And if you agree or endorse or have some positive uh, reaction to what I ask, I want you to say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can, can you do that? Oh, yeah. Are you awake? Oh, yeah. OK. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a dream. And a dream I had was I was arriving to give this talk. And uh, I went to the address that Dan gave me where the talk was going to happen. And it was an intersection in the territory. And I got there, and I knew this was the right place for this talk because there was kind of a nice green area, uh, grassy area, and with about 200 chairs. So I figured I'm, I'm in the right place. Um, but I did think it was kind of an interesting place to have this meeting, right? And so then. Uh, and I had arrived half an hour early planning ahead because I hadn't prepared any remarks. And I figured I'd use the half an hour before the meeting to kind of get my thoughts together. And so as soon as I get there, um, somebody puts a microphone in my hand, just like this one, and said, uh, Dan said that you were going to take questions for the half an hour before the talk. And I said, well, OK, that's kind of weird, but oh, OK, fine. Uh, but there was like nobody there in the audience. Um, and so, but the person who gave me the microphone said, oh, no, the, the people that are going to ask the questions are out in the neighborhood, in the territory. And he gave me a list. And I said, well, OK, that seems kind of funny. But so this is, you know, how things are in a dream. So I went out there. And I went up, uh, you know, there were six different places, uh, people who were going to ask me questions. So I go to the first house. You know, it takes about five minutes to find the house. I go to the first house, knock on the door, step back a couple steps. and. Uh, Lady comes to the door, young woman in a house coat with a baby, holding her uh, a baby. And then in the background, I can hear another baby crying. And so I said, oh, hi, I'm Ira Wilson. Uh, I understand you have a question for me. And I held out the microphone. And so, so she kind of looks at me like I have three heads and sort of slowly closes the door. And I hear this click as it locks. <laughs> OK. I'm, I'm OK with this. I have positive attitude. So I go to the next house. And it, you know, I have to, it's actually hot out. And so I had my suit coat. I took my suit coat off because I was beginning to sweat. Ran kind of jogging to the next house because I had to get these six questions in. So I go to the next house. I just do the same thing, knock on the door, step back a couple steps. Woman comes to the door. And, uh, uh, and she looks at me. She says, yes. And so I said, oh, hi, I'm Ira Wilson. And I put the microphone on. I said, I understand you have a question for me. And uh, she kind of turns away and she says, honey, and I hear this voice in the back, yes. And she says, uh, call the police. <laughs> so, so she shuts the door, click, it locks. So I'm not going to go on and tell uh, the rest of this dream, because this kind of goes on. And I, I heard Emma talk about visualization. Emma, is this what you were visualizing? Did, ever that, did anyone have, have an experience like this? So this went on and on. Uh, and then finally, uh, I look at my watch, and I'm half an hour late for the talk. And so I say, oh, i got to get back. So uh, I go to the intersection, and there are no street signs on the streets, and there are no numbers on the houses, and then I wake up. 
So how many of you have ever had a Bookfield dream like that? Oh, yeah. So, let's hear an oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so it's interesting. Here I am, 61 years old. I haven't held a sample case for 41 years, and I had an anxiety dream. <laughs> and it's all your fault. <laughs> but, but actually, the reason I brought this up is, uh, you know, presumably anxiety dreams like this about the book field are about performance anxiety. Now, the first part of performance anxiety is performance. Now, that's a, like a really good thing, right? We all want to perform. We, do, we all want to do well. I heard Ryan mention the word anxiety and pressure. And you heard the panelists all talk about kind of pressure. And the main thing I want to say is, if you guys aren't a little bit concerned and a little bit worried about what's going to happen when you leave here, what the winter is going to be like, what the spring is going to be like, and what the summer is going to be like, if you're not a little bit worried, then you don't have high enough goals. It is normal to be worried a little bit. You should be worried. And part of the purpose of today and part of the purpose of hopefully my remarks is to help you think about how to change some of that passion and concern and interest that makes you worried into productivity. So. Um, in order to give you a little flavor of, um, uh, to be able to share some remarks with you, I want to give you a little context about, uh, you have to know a little bit about who I am. So I arrived my freshman year, and I tried out for a lot of things. I was a good athlete in high school. I tried out for the soccer team, didn't make the varsity, didn't make the JV, didn't make the freshman. But I was optimistic. I was actually a better tennis player than a soccer player. So I tried out for the tennis team, didn't make the... Varsity didn't make the junior varsity, didn't make the freshman. But that was okay because I was a really good musician and I was a good singer. I was in the All-State and the All-New England Chorus. So I tried out for something called the Crocodillos, which was this kind of hot all-male singing group. Didn't make the Crocodillos. But I figured I'd at least make the, the Glee Club because there were 80 people in the Glee Club. Didn't make the Glee Club. But the backup, of course, is I knew I could make the Collegium Musicum. That was 240 people, half men, half women, didn't make the Collegium Musicum. So this was not an auspicious start to my freshman year. But I had a job my freshman year. Uh, as part of my financial aid package, um, my, uh, we had a, a $5,000 government loan and a work-study job, and this was my work-study job, cleaning bathrooms at Quincy House 15 hours a week. So every single day from 1 to 4 in the afternoon, I went to Quincy House and I cleaned bathrooms. And you know, in retrospect, you know what I learned from that experience? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> totally worthless experience. No growth whatsoever. But I did make $3.50 an hour, which helped me pay for books, and that was good. So I arrived at, uh, at college wanting to be a pre-med and to finish my pre-med requirements, uh, but to major concentrate in something else like government or history, because those were topics I was much more interested in. So I got there, uh, looked at my courses, absolutely loved the courses in political science uh, and political theory, and so I decided I would delay these plans to take my pre-med requirements. Any pre-meds here? Okay. Well, I will tell you that one of the things that made me not want to be a pre-med was you guys. Uh, <laughs> no. But back then, I was kind of immature, and the attitudes of the pre-medical students in, uh, that I saw didn't seem like the ones that I wanted to emulate. But in any event, um, so I decided to delay my plans to do pre-med requirements. Uh, maybe till the next semester, maybe till the next year. When I went home for Thanksgiving, I found out that my father was taking out 17% loans to pay my uh, room board and tuition. 17% loans. Go back to 1973 and look what the prime rate was. That was the cost of a short-term loan. So I confronted my father and I said, look, I said, this is ridiculous, this is unbelievable. I said, look, we don't have savings to pay for college. We have to do it this way. And I had a sister who was coming after me and a brother after, after her, and, and he said, look, I said, how are you going to do this? He said, he said look, we'll figure it out. Uh, he says, it's not your responsibility. You just go to school. And, but, but that's not how I was. I did, I did think it was my responsibility. So that was really the first time when I said, you know what? I think I want to do something more than cleaning bathrooms. And I think I need to do something more than cleaning bathrooms. But the biggest thing that happened to me my freshman year was that 
I met people from all over the country and all over the world, and I realized that my life experience was very, very narrow uh, and very parochial. And I was little by little more and more determined to change that. So uh, in the spring semester of my freshman year, I took this course. It was a distribution required, a humanities course called The Great Age of Athens. It was actually taught by a very famous guy, this guy, John Finley, uh, who was an erudite, uh, very famous professor. This course had 800 people. Uh, and it was actually quite a wonderful course. But the thing I want to tell you about is a lecture that happened in April uh, of that year. Uh, and that was a lecture on Homer's Odyssey. Um, how many people have read Homer's Odyssey? Let's have an oh yeah. Oh yeah. OK. Well, if you haven't read it, you actually really should. It is insanely cool. So, so, so Odysseus is this guy who fights in the Trojan War with a whole bunch of his uh, people from the island of Ithaca. And they win the Trojan War. They got on their boats to go back to Ithaca from, uh, from where the Trojan War was in, in, uh, in what's now Turkey. Um, but they go through all these crazy things that happened to them over the course of, uh, of a couple of years. This is, um, uh, this is a famous painting by Max Beckman. This is Calypso, a sea nymph who seduces and falls in love with Odysseus. And he can only get away because he's rescued by Zeus. Um, but by the way, this is not a, a viable strategy when you're in trouble in general. Um, this is another beautiful example of uh, a painting by J.W. Waterhouse. This is the sirens, and the sirens were these beautiful women that came and sang to sailors driving, you know, going by in boats. And they would bring them over to the island and then kill them. And so Circe, who was a sea nymph, actually told Odysseus, the only way you could get by this area was to actually put wax in the ears of all of your sailors, beeswax, so they couldn't hear it. Odysseus, he wanted to hear it, but he had his, his crew lash him to the mast so he couldn't respond to the sirens. Anyway, should we go on about the Odyssey? I don't think we need to. Anyway, this was, for me, really cool. But the thing that was most amazing is um, the way John Finley talked about the Odyssey as a metaphor for college. And so he talked about how important it was for college students to go out and he said, and breast the world. He talked about breasting the world as this important thing that uh, we had to do. So I left that lecture, it was April, uh, the sun was out, it was 65 degrees, and I was bound and determined not to go home that summer. So two weeks later, <clears throat> a week and a half later, I'm walking home, it's about 6.30, and this guy, Ben Davis comes up to me. Actually, he didn't look that way then. Um, he's, a, he's a law professor, and this is a recent picture. So he comes up to me, and, and he said, I don't know him from Adam. He comes up to me, it's a cold call, and he says to me, he says, you know, would you be interested in a job um, that where, where you'd get to work in some part of the United States you'd never been to and make $3,000? And back then I was just as cool as I am now, Good, that's a joke. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so I said, yeah, yeah, I said, I'll take that pamphlet, you know. Uh, but inside, I'm saying, hell yes, I'm doing this, right? All I had to hear was the going away $3,000, I was actually sold. So what I did was, was I went to the Sheraton Commander Hotel. Uh, I think it was 742, actually. And this guy named Dan Moore, who oh, had a a white turtleneck sweater, and black mustache, black hair. That was a while ago. Um, and he explained what this program was like. About a third of the way through, uh, I convinced, I said to myself, look, I'm doing this, OK? Uh, I knew it was for me. Uh, and, and, but in fact, he did a really great job uh, at explaining the program. And he did a really good job closing. But really, I was closed out by a 65-year-old classics professor and a Greek poet who wrote in 800 BC. Now, the point I want to make about Ben Davis is the following. When Ben Davis came up to me and said, you want to come to this thing, he changed my life. He literally changed my life. So when I look back, you can see, in retrospect, that that was a pivot. There was a branch point. And my life has been different ever since in immense numbers of positive ways because of what Ben Davis did. So why do I mention that? Because you are heading out 
to do something difficult. And there's going to be times this, this winter and this spring when you say, you know what? I've got exams. I've got papers. I've got all kinds of other commitments. This is too damn hard. I can't do this. And when that happens, I want you to ask yourself one question, and that is, who am I going to be a, De a Ben Davis for today? Just think about that. So then I went out and sold books my first summer. So I actually lived with a great student manager, a guy named George Verghese, ran a great headquarters. I stayed on schedule and I worked really hard. I was exposed, as all of you have been, to these interesting new concepts, how to keep a schedule, how to control my emotions. I had this intense and very interesting exposure to people very different from me. Interestingly, I, I felt supported, respected, cared about uh, it, by this really very different community of people uh, that I had, the, a, a community that was different than I had ever experienced before. Uh, in, in particular, the positive attitude was something, honestly, um, now, look, I know the people you hang out with at college are really positive, but the people I hang out with were not always positive. And I learned to cope with adversity a lot that summer. And I tell you, I had a lot of uh, adversity. What do I mean by that? Well, I was not very good at selling books. Um, you know, Dan said he and I went out and sold books. <laughs> the selling part, that's the sold books was true for him. It wasn't that true for me. <laughs> In fact, frankly, I sucked at it, right? That's a, that's a technical expression in, that we use in medicine. It means performance substantially below expectations. Um, so I made about $800 from well over 1,000 hours of work. You can do the math. I can't. I'm too depressed to even look at it. So here's what really brought home how bad I was. This guy. So this is Johnny Ussery. I've never met Johnny Ussery. I, I got this off, uh, off the internet. Um, <laughs> Johnny Ussery was the number one salesman in the education division uh, that year. Now, Johnny Ussery did not work harder than me. And I know he didn't, because you can't. I worked more than 80 hours a week. But you know what Johnny Ussery did? Johnny Ussery was way smarter than me. Way smarter than me. He made better decisions. He used his time and he used his energy way more intelligently than I did. So I want you to know just how bad I was. So I was eager and I was diligent, and that's really important. But I was certainly unteachable and I was probably a little bit arrogant too. And what do I mean by that? I'm just going to give you one example. I could give you ver all kinds of examples. But the idea of ignoring objections and closing before someone said, that they wanted to buy was a complete anathema to me. I knew, deep in my heart, that that was rude. And I was not going to do it. <laughs> so you might ask, how did I ever even know that it was rude? Because my first summer, I didn't even try that. I never really tried not answering objections. You know, I actually worked with Dan one day, and he watched me close. And after he watched me do it once, he said, I know your problem. You don't know how to close. And, uh, but I didn't get through. I didn't get it, what the problem was. So, however, in the end, I was smart enough to see um, that, frankly, there's some things I needed to change and I needed to do better. And I was, frankly, embarrassed by how badly I had done. So, back at school, um, you know, I sat down to say, okay, it's the beginning of my sophomore year, I'm trying to organize what I'm going to do. And one thing I've always done naturally is kind of think about how to organize myself and what I was doing. So I had this incredibly strong sense that there were some things about me I needed to get better at. It's not like I needed to fix them, but I had so many things that I had learned I was weak in, things I needed to work on. And I also had this deep sense, and you heard this from the panelists too, I had this deep sense that um, others could benefit from the experience I've had. I think you all, uh, you all wouldn't be here if you didn't have that as well. But I decided to concentrate in a very sort of academically demanding, okay, nerdy um, uh, concentration called social studies and interdepartmental concentration. It was actually very difficult, very competitive. You had to apply to get into it, and I had gotten into it the previous year. So I had a lot of commitments to my academic stuff, uh, but I decided that I wanted to build a team. My friends were not exactly supportive. So I hung out with 
a bunch of political activists, mostly pretty leftist. And you know, when I would tell them what, about what I did in the summer, they were, well, they weren't enthusiastic. So is it fair to say that not all of the people you talk to about this job are enthusiastic? Did, did any of you get a little bit of negativity on occasion? Yeah. So my friends not only thought uh, this was crazy, but they actually thought I should be committed, right? So I, I was committed, but not to an institution. You know, they, they meant something different. Uh, I'm, some, I'm amazed that 40 years later that there's, there's still some negativity out there. Uh, so I was actually a really slow learner, and I want to... I want to make a couple reflections in a minute, but you have to understand what Dan said is right. I sold for four summers, doubled and tripled my sales each summer. I built three teams each time. They did two or three times as much business as the prior one. Okay, well, that's good, but when you start on a base, which is horrible, it's easy to grow, right? <laughs> so I want to make the point that I was not successful early or, or fast in any of these things. Uh, the other thing is, I was only willing to commit, commit about 10 hours a week to, doing, uh, to building a team. I just didn't see how I could like, live my life the way I wanted to live it and spend more than 10 hours a week on this. So that was a challenge. So a, a couple reflections. There's just some things I want to share with you, which may or may not kind of make sense to you. But, um, but the first thing is, is that you don't have to have your life figured out or have any concrete long-term goals to build a team. So if you don't have all this stuff figured out, that's fine. You do need to be convinced that there are things out there that you can learn from doing this. Um, and, and these are things that you will never learn from any other endeavor that you do in college. Do you believe that? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. it's true. So. If you're somebody who doesn't have their whole life planned out, who doesn't know what they're going to be doing, you know, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, I think you're in good company, um, and that's fine. But focus on what you want to do in the next four to five months, and, um, uh, and as Bill Belichick, the coach of the New England Patriots, would say, do your job. So reflection two. Now this is, this may be just me. But I actually was worried uh, that committing to building a team was going to make me into something that I didn't think I really was. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I had this sense that if I kind of committed whole hog to do this, I would end up being a person that really wasn't me. Now, if anyone happens to be thinking that, I want to challenge you to flip that totally on its head. And I would argue that the only way you can actually be a strong leader and be an excellent leader is to be completely true to yourself and to your core values, whatever those are. So the way to be successful, in fact, and if, I was, if there's anything that I did well at this job as opposed to the things I screwed up, it was this. The way to be successful is to take the principles, the concepts, the ideas that you learn here and in other meetings, but then apply them in a way um, which maps onto who you are as a unique individual, right? So in other words, you take the principles and the ideas and the concept and you make them yours. Now, that's not easy. It takes work, it takes effort, and it takes collaboration with, uh, with managers, but it is possible and it's important. So the third reflection uh, is that we, we all grow and develop at different rates. And I hope I've convinced you that my rate of development was not particularly fast. Now, there are going to be some of you, I know, I know this is true, some of you didn't have the summer that you wanted to have last summer or didn't have the size team you wanted to have last year, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, I'm just not so good at this as other people, okay? But I want to convince you that there is absolutely no limits on what you can do this spring and this summer if you figure out the things that you need to do and you do the work. So I want to turn now to the last 40 years uh, since I left the book field. Um, as Dan said, I've been a physician and a teacher. I do research on how physicians and patients talk to each other. Or, as the case may be, uh, don't talk to each other. Because actually, physicians and patients communicate terribly, and it has 
terrible consequences for people's health. Uh, so we've done all kinds of qualitative research, observational studies, large healthcare database analysis. And we've done randomized trials where we try to improve the way in which physicians talk to patients. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do actually is present a case to you. So this is a case of a 62-year-old unemployed combat veteran. I actually work at the Veterans Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, and half of the last 10 years. He's an unemployed combat vet, disabled because of anxiety, depression, some other quite serious mental health problems. He's a smoker, has lung disease, has hypertension, has high cholesterol. He has a long history of substance abuse. And when I first got to know him, he had polysubstance abuse. Um, and over time, with the help of some others, we got him clean and sober, which um, is, was quite an accomplishment. But he's a guy who could never keep an apartment. Um, and he would only come in intermittently. Sometimes it would be six, eight, nine, ten months um, uh, bef between visits. And if you met him, um, he's not the kind of guy you'd necessarily sort of want to sit next to in the airport, right? So uh, he was disheveled. Uh, he had a bunch of gang tattoos on his face and on his neck that were quite obvious. Never hid them. So I saw him in this particular visit, and I said, so, you know, are you still smoking? And he said, yeah. He says, Doc, I'm just addicted. I've tried to quit. I can't. I really want to quit. I just can't do it. And so I said to him, I said, well, why do you want to quit? So he said, oh, lots of reasons. He says, I know you shouldn't smoke. It's bad for you. It's a dirty habit. He says, I'll breathe better. I want to get in shape. I want to have more money. He says, there's, there's lots of reasons. So I said, well, OK. Um, I said, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, how important is it for you um, to quit smoking? You know, 1 being not important, 10 being very important. And he says, oh, definitely a 10. So then I said, well, how confident are you that you think you could quit smoking? And he said, uh, he says, probably 7. And I said, OK, well, what do you think it would take for you to go from a 7 to a 10? <laughs> he said, I guess I just have to convince myself. I need to keep thinking about it. I've tried the gum and the patch, and none of them work. So I said, well, is there anything I could do to help? And we talked a little bit. OK, so he comes back four months later. And <laughs> it was interesting. So he kind of walks in like this. He goes, he kind of walks in like this. He goes, hey, Doc, what's happening? And I'm thinking, oh, well, this is different. And he says, hey, Doc, I haven't had a cigarette in about four months since about the last time I saw you. He says, I can't tell you how much better I feel. I can breathe better. I have more money. He says, I just really feel good. Now, so I'm not pretending this is what happens every time I do smoking cessation counseling. But, um, but I do want to um, ask you to reflect on something. And there's a reason. So did I try to persuade him, to convince him, to kind of give him advice? Did I wheedle, cajole, anything like that? I didn't, no. So I'm just addicted, can't quit, want to quit. And I just said, well, why do you want to quit? And he said, I want to do this and that. And, um, uh, and then I just said, well, how, how important would that be to you? And then I said, well, how convinced are you that you can do this? And then I said, is there anything I can do to help? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take one minute. I want you to talk to the person in the seat right next to you, 30 seconds each. And I want you to analyze what goes on, what went on here. And I want you to think about what, what would you name or what would you call, what expression would you use to represent the words in red? Go. Ten seconds. OK, so, so normally what I would love to do would be to take some time 
and get some feedback from each one of you uh, or from several groups. We don't have time to do that. But what I want to tell you is those words in red are trial closes. Now, if you didn't come up with that, right away I want you to think about it. So let me circle back to what I said before. You remember how I said I thought it was rude to ask someone to buy something when they hadn't already said they wanted, they were ready to buy it? Remember that? Actually, that's right. It is rude. The part I missed was the part about trial closes and how you use trial closes to figure out where someone is in their decision-making process. So the purpose of going through this is I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what I'll call authentic listening. I want to start off by saying this is incredibly difficult skill to learn. I won't argue that it's necessary for you to build a team or an organization, but I will argue if you can figure out how to be an authentic listener, that not only you will be far more successful, but you have lots more fun. And you heard from these panelists, actually, uh, it was interesting about how you change pressure and tension into kind of relaxation and releasing kind of the positive energy. Um, this is a way to do that. And I also will tell you that if you can figure out how to listen well, there are amazing payoffs in other parts of your life, your personal life, your family life, uh, other organizations and activities you're involved in. So what is authentic listening? So authentic listening is listening to understand. Now, it's listening from someone else's perspective. Now, here's the thing that's, that's complicated. This is not listening to respond or contest or to achieve any kind of advantage. Do you ever have one of those conversations where you're listening to somebody, but at the same time you're figuring out why they're wrong and what you're gonna say to convince them that you're right? Right? Give me an oh yeah if that's ever happened to you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So authentic listening is very different. So what does it feel like to be on the other end of authentic listening? It makes people feel respected, validated, legitimated, and understood as a person. For those of you who are interested in philosophy, Jürgen Habermas is a, is a, a German philosopher who wrote in the 1980s and made this important distinction between communicative action, which is communication designed simply to improve understanding and strategic action, which is communication that has a goal of getting someone else to do something that you want them to do. So I want to make a critical distinction here, and I think you all will see this, but it's really important. So selling a product is about meeting a con concrete need, right? It's not all that complicated, really. Although, <laughs> it took me a while to figure it out, that's for sure. Um, but building a team is actually about creating and nurturing relationships, which, if you do it really well, necessarily involves authentic listening. It is incredibly difficult to learn to be an authentic listener. Um, but I want you to think about how being an expert authentic listener might actually change your life, not only in the way in which you perform better in this endeavor that you're here learning about, but in other parts of your life too. And here's the thing, building a team with the kind of supports and training that Southwestern provides is, I think, an incredibly powerful, incredibly effective way to exercise and develop what I'll call this sort of critical mental muscle. This is actually a book that I only read about six weeks ago. I just tripped across it by a guy named Edgar Shines called Humble Inquiry. It's a wonderful book. He defines un humble inquiry. He says it's the art, the fine art of drawing someone out, of asking questions to which you do not already know the answer, of building a relationship based on curiosity and interest in the other person. So I want to come back uh, to the Odyssey. So this is Homer's poem about overcoming obstacles, obstacles keeping focusing, focused on the goal of getting back to Ithaca, where his wife Penelope was waiting, uh, and being tortured, by the way, by suitors who were drinking all the wine and killing all the pigs and trying to get them, her to marry them. Bad problem. A lot of people have actually written poems about the Odyssey, and there's a famous poem by uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, uh, and, and he looks at Ithaca in this poem as the end of life, and the voyage itself is a metaphor for life. And here's what the last stanza says. He says, we are not now that strength which in old day moved earth and heaven, 
That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and faith, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So ask yourself, do you want to learn how to do this? And how are you going to learn to do this? And can what you're hearing about this weekend and this week teach you some of those things? And I hope the answers to those are all yes. This is another poem by C.P. Cavafy, uh, a Greek poet, actually lived in Alexandria, Egypt, didn't live in Greece. Um, and he said, keep Ithaca, this is the last stanza of a poem, it's not too long. Keep Ithaca always in your mind, arriving there is what you are destined for, but do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained along the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Now the part I want to focus on here is, what, is when he says, but do not hurry the journey at all. This is a tweet from Warren Buffett, who says direction is more important than speed. This is not quite so elegant and erudite, but it is um, quite to the point. So I want to make a couple conclusions uh, and then make, uh, tell one final story. So um, I want to offer you an authentic listening challenge. You all listening? It's your homework. Oh yeah, good. So here's a challenge. I want you to find in the next week somebody who you do not know, you do not understand, and you believe is completely different from you. And I want you to have a conversation with them, and I want you to try to listen. Not to convince them of anything, but just because you're curious about how they think. So if you're straight, find someone who's gay. If you're Jewish, find someone who's Muslim. If you're Republican, find someone who's a Democrat. Find someone who's really different from you and challenge yourself. One of the things you're going to learn is that this is really hard. You also, I think, will begin to appreciate that it is a very important skill to have. The second thing I want you to all remember is that, and, and you heard this from the panel. I thought the panel was wonderful because each one of them was great for for different reasons in a different way, right? Could you see that? They all brought their own unique individuality to their sales. Well, I want you to do the same thing to your, uh, your team building. You're all unique, and I want you to think about how you can innovate and more creatively align who you are with what you want to accomplish. But I warn you, this, is, <laughs> this just doesn't happen by itself. It's really hard work, and you got to keep working at it. But when you get there, you will be way, way uh, more effective, w a, a way stronger leader, and you will have the ability to tie your people to you in ways you couldn't otherwise. And lastly, this is, this is just a plea to resist the urge to make premature decisions about your identity and purpose in life. Uh, it isn't when you get somewhere. You know, it's who you are, when you get there, that really counts. So I'm going to finish with uh, a, a brief story. Um, this is about something that happened in 1979. Uh, so I, I had just finished my fourth summer selling books. Dan told you about it. I had the number one team in the education division. Um, and <clears throat> came back to Nashville. And I told Dan that, um, no, I'm not selling books again. It's been great, but I have to move on to do other things in my life. And we had a short conversation about that in Nashville. And then six weeks later, we got together in Cambridge. Uh, because he called me up and said, uh, you know, let's talk. Now, I knew what was coming, right? I was going to get the real strong arm pitch, right? What I didn't know is that his boss had told him that one of his main goals for the year was to get me back with the program. So, so we got together, and Dan said, um, he said, gee, tell me what, uh, what's up and what you're thinking. And so I think I spent probably... 20 minutes or 30 minutes, um, and he just listened and listened and listened and listened and listened. And, and, and then he said, well, he says, you know, it sounds like you're thinking really hard about all these things, and it sounds like you have some plans. He said, but, you know, I really think you could benefit from, um, you know, another summer selling books. And so, so I'm thinking in my head, is this the hard sell? Is this the pitch that you're going to give me? And, and that was, that was all the pitch was. Now, here's the thing. Dan 
is an authentic listener. Dan had been listening to me for three years. Dan knew what I wanted to do. He cared more that I do what I needed to do for me than he cared about me doing what he wanted me to do for him. Does that make sense? That is, to me, the definition of integrity. Now, the reason I say that is because how many of you have um, two years or less with this company? Okay, so those of you, um, a lot of new people here. You all may not know Dan Moore very well, but I want, I want you to know a couple things. And the most important thing is this company is led from the top by someone of tremendous integrity who is a very authentic listener, and you can count on him. You can trust him to listen to you, to be honest, to tell you the truth, and to do what is in, to suggest that you do what is in your best interest. Now, he doesn't know I was going to say that, um, and I'm saying it because it's, it's true. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a great uh, winter and spring and summer, and appreciate your attention. I just want Ira to know that because he didn't come back, I had massive credit card debt, I wasn't able to buy a house, and it was just really a frustrating time in my life, and it's all your fault. <laughs> I have a gift for Ira. This is the Superstar book in which he had the number one team in the Southwestern Company, a souvenir being here. I have a copy of his big check from his first summer of $775.83. See, I was, in, I was inflating how much I actually made. <laughs> and of course, he's going to get what? Oh. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Ira. This is, this is super.